Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes of all time, and it's crazy to think that the character has been around for over 60 years now. They love me. It's led to too many comics to count, three very successful movie franchises, and one that kind of sucks. So many snacks, so little time. And of course, a huge fan base that only got bigger over time. Over the last three months or so, I read the first decade of Spider-Man comics, and actually a little more, starting in 1962, going all the way to 1973, ending with arguably the best Spider-Man comic ever made. It was a lot to read, but it was insanely fun, and honestly very interesting to see how the Web Slinger got his start. I had read bits and pieces of the early stuff, mainly the most iconic ones, but a good 80% I had not read before. Being amped up on Spider-Man hype, I wanted to do a sort of retrospective and review on the early days of the Web Slinger. I'm gonna take a look at just how good these stories were, see how they stand the test of time, and as we go, I'll even show you how the early comics influenced all of the movies he appears in. Peter, I want you to know that I... You know. That's what we do. Now, this is not my normal content, but I have made a few Spider-Man videos, one of which did pretty well. But it would mean a lot to me if you guys could hit that like button to help with the algorithm, and even more if you could share this video with other webhead friends you have. Because after three months of work, I want as many people to enjoy this as possible. So anyway, let's get into it. Oh, Spider-Man. One of the things that made Spider-Man so popular was his age. Comic book writers had been trying so hard to appeal to younger audiences, so they had their adult superheroes have young sidekicks. But Stan Lee geniusly said, why can't the main hero be a kid? Instantly, Peter Parker and his alter ego Spider-Man became one of the most popular and exciting comic series out there, because kids could relate to him, and as could adults who were once his age. Stan Lee's partnership with artist Steve Ditko was another thing that made the series so good. Ditko and Lee changed the game with how they worked as Lee gave the artist much more freedom to help with the story. I always loved the way Ditko drew Spider-Man in this unnatural way, almost like he was a real insect. Spider-Man made his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy number 15, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the origin because if I'm being honest, it's been shoved down our throats enough with two movie franchises. However, I wanted to do something fun and point out the differences between the comics and the movies, because for me personally, in my head, I pretty much took on the movie canon for his origin because I had seen it so many times. But one of the biggest differences was the fact that Peter never actually saw his uncle die the way he did in the first two movie franchises or the way he saw Aunt May die. Instead, he was just told by a cop, and the murder actually happened in their own house during a robbery, which I had forgotten. Also, the iconic line, With great power comes great responsibility. First of all, wasn't said correctly in the first Sam Raimi film, but Aunt May did say it correctly. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. But interestingly, this line was not said by any character. It wasn't even thought by Peter, but rather was said by the narrator. A funny detail I noticed was the reward for the wrestling match. In the comic, it was $100, while in the movie, it was $3,000. But in the movie, Peter was ripped off, only getting, you guessed it, $100. 100 bucks? The ad said 3000 Something that I'm sure was a callback to the source material. After the popularity of his origin story, Lee and Ditko got their own series focusing solely on the amazing Spider-Man, and they hit the ground running. We sort of have a villain of the month formula to start, which can be repetitive at times, but in the long run, because these villains are so unique and interesting, it's not as bad as you might think. In fact, it's actually pretty good. Lee and Ditko looked at villains in a different way than most comics at the time. They gave each one an origin story just like the hero, which really developed an amazing rogues gallery, and I've gotta say, it's nice to see villains that aren't just evil for the sake of being evil, they have true motives that made them that way. With the exception of a few like the Hobgoblin and Venom, every single villain we saw in the movies was introduced in the first 14 issues. We have the Vulture in the second, Doc Ock in the third, Sandman in the fourth, Lizard in the sixth, Electro in the ninth, Mysterio in the thirteenth, and the Green Goblin in the fourteenth. And if we look at the whole decade I'm covering in this video, we even get the side villains like Rhino in the 41st, the Shocker in the 46th, and even Morbius in the 101st, who just got the worst freaking movie by the way. It's terrible. Don't go see it. It's so crazy to see how these villains, who were created so long ago, still stand the test of time. Lee and Ditko hit the mark right out of the gate, and honestly, they've barely been changed since then, something you don't see very often. 
That being said though, the two did rely a bit on other properties like the Fantastic Four to ensure that Spider-Man got readers, which sort of disappointed me because it meant they didn't 100% believe that Spider-Man could carry his own story. The first ever issue featured the Fantastic Four, and in the fifth issue, they used the Fantastic Four's villain Doctor Doom, and honestly sort of butchered his character, he wasn't anything like himself here. But talking about the positive things, one thing I fell in love with was the spider signal. I so wish they utilized this in the films more. We really only saw Tom Holland Spidey have it in the Civil War post credit scene, but he didn't use it to scare criminals. One thing I found weird was that even after getting his powers, Peter continued to wear his glasses in the comics until one day Flash knocked them off and smashed them. But that's not until issue 8, and afterwards, Peter is like, whatever, I don't need them anyway. So was he just needlessly wearing glasses? I guess he wasn't that blind then. In the movie, he of course got rid of them right away because as we saw, it was insanely blurry when he put them back on. Weird. In the earliest comics, Peter is of course in high school at Midtown High, the setting for all three movies at some point or another. When compared to the later times in Peter's life, the cast around him at Midtown was sort of lacking. Really, the only notable students were Liz Allen, who was of course featured in the Tom Holland movies, and Flash Thompson, who we saw in all three movie franchises. But aside from them, there were just the guys around Flash, most of whom were nameless, and the girls around Liz, again, most of whom were unknown. Other characters include J. Jonah Jameson, who was perfectly cast in the movie by the way. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. And of course Aunt May, who was a character that surprised me because she might be the most annoying character in the comics, and I'll explain why as I go through the video. Peter is a pretty big loser in the earliest comics, and honestly, he doesn't have any real friends. The only person that really shows up for him is Betty Brandt, who he eventually starts dating in the seventh issue. Welcome to the Daily Bugle. Thank you. Also, just something fun to point out in that same issue, there's a moment where Aunt May walks into Peter's room while he's still in his Spidey costume, and he jumps to the ceiling before she can see him, which is of course a scene that was recreated in the first Sam Raimi film. I just thought that was a cool detail. The first issue I want to really highlight and take a deeper look at though is issue number 10 called The Enforcers. We're introduced to a new villain that goes by the name of The Big Man. Betty's involved in business with him, which we later find out has to do with her brother who was in over his head. But when Peter gets involved, Betty runs away to protect him. At the end of the issue, we find out that this big man who was giving the Brandt siblings trouble was actually a reporter at the Daily Bugle named Frederick Foswell. He's of course arrested, and as we go, I'll cover his story because he's an interesting character. This arc continues into the next issue called The Return of Dr. Octopus. It details Betty's brother and his involvement with breaking Doc Ock out of prison. Ultimately, Betty's brother is shot during the final battle, and she blames Spider-Man for his death, making Peter's relationship with Betty a whole lot more complicated. But one of the things that makes this one of the most important early comics was the fact that we found out one crucial thing about J. Jonah Jameson, why he hates Spider-Man. It's explained that he basically realizes that Spider-Man is a better person than him, and that the hero represents everything that he himself is not. He envies Spider-Man, and he says that he would give up his millions to be a man just like him. It's pretty wild that this rivalry was brought up so early in Spider-Man's run, and is still one of the cornerstones of Spider-Man comics, and even the movies, 60 years later. Governments around the world launch investigations into the murderer known as Spider-Man. As I said before, issue number 14 brought in the Green Goblin for the first time, and he was one of the most exciting villains so far simply because he was the only villain who had a secret identity. It was made this mystery at the end of the issue, which intrigued so many readers at the time. The Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 1 is a big one to highlight because it's the first time we see the Sinister Six. It took the creators a whole year to develop, and at the time, I think it was their best work. One thing cool about it is it features a small cameo from every major Marvel hero at the time. First Thor, then Doctor Strange, Giant Man, the Fantastic Four, Captain America, Iron Man, and the X-Men. The six villains' downfall is their arrogance, as they all think they can beat Spider-Man on their own. So Spider-Man fights all six separately, and each defeat is shown in this beautiful, full-page illustration by Ditko. This story also highlights Peter's powers mysteriously deserting him, which was actually heavily covered in the second Sam Raimi film. Why is this happening to me? In both the movie and the comic, we find out that this is brought on by guilt of losing his Uncle Ben. This is also a great time to bring up why I think Aunt May is the most annoying character. So in this issue, she and Betty are kidnapped by Doc Ock, and her dumbass doesn't realize this, instead thinking he's a charming gentleman who's graciously hosting them. Even when Betty tries to tell her, she doesn't listen. God, I'm sorry, that's just not the answer we were looking for. 
As we move through the early issues, you'll see Peter become less and less nerdy, and that's quite clear when a rivalry between Betty Brand and Liz Allen starts to rile up, both going for Peter's heart. There are several occasions where the two fight over him, trying to make the other jealous, and one time the two even raced to Peter's house, but they found a surprise there, the beautiful Mary Jane Watson. And that brings me to the next issue I want to highlight, number 25 entitled Captured by J. Jonah Jameson. This was the first time we saw MJ. Well, sort of. They cover her face, which is actually part of a running joke. Aunt May is always trying to get Peter to meet up with her best friend's niece, but Peter and we the readers assume her to be ugly, which in itself is a great fake out. So Peter always avoids it and just barely misses her every time. But then when Betty and Liz see her in issue number 25, they're shocked at how stunning she is, which throws the readers for a loop and heightens the mystery of Mary Jane Watson. There are actually a lot of running jokes in these comics that I never really appreciated until diving into the early stories. One of my favorites is Jonah always saying he's a softy when he's the literal opposite, but everyone's so fed up with him that they just let him rock. There's also Aunt May not knowing how certain sayings go, one of my favorites being her saying hep instead of hip and slinger instead of swinger. There's also the running joke that's not really a joke, but at the same time, it's so constant that it's almost funny. Spider-Man always getting the worst endings. Every comic ends on a down note for Peter. Hello darkness, my old friend. Around this time, Frederick Foswell, otherwise known as the big man from earlier, is freed from prison and he starts his job at the Bugle again. Jameson trusts him with his life, but Peter and Spidey aren't so sure. And that brings me to the next story I want to highlight called The Man in the Crime Master's Mask. Peter is convinced that Foswell is this crime master and he goes to many lengths to prove it. While he's checking out the crime master's meeting, he's attacked and beaten by the Green Goblin, which was a first at the time. No one had ever gotten the better of him thus far. The scene where the Goblin has Spidey at his mercy is very similar to the scene where he's on the roof in the first Raimi film, and I have no doubt that Raimi used these panels as inspiration for his own scene. The Goblin upstages the crime master with the KO'd Spidey, and it leads to a wild fight and a crazy escape from Spider-Man. He eventually corners Foswell, accusing him of being the crime master, but moments later, he discovers that it wasn't Foswell, and not only that, finds out that Foswell actually helped the police capture the real crime master, proving just how much Foswell has changed. What I like about this story is it doesn't glamorize Spider-Man. He's not always right, and in this case, he was actually dead wrong. It adds a nice layer of reality to his character and makes him more relatable to us readers. Just like us, he's not perfect. This is even more true as we see Peter get into a fight with Flash. He loses control of his anger for a second, and luckily for him, he levels himself out, but he did get sent to the principal's office for this. Flash later went to the principal though, telling him it was his fault, something we never expected, nor did Peter. Flash and Peter have one of the most intriguing relationships because it's so up and down. Flash is of course Spider-Man's biggest fan, even starting a Spider-Man fan club, which makes Peter appreciate him because at the time, most people thought Spider-Man was bad news thanks to Jameson's paper. And the relationship only gets more complicated, which I'll go over more as we go. Sub penis, Parker! Issue number 28 was a turning point in Spider-Man's story as we see Peter graduate from high school. To be honest, I kind of forgot how early he finished up there, maybe because the movies and even a lot of the animated TV shows always show him at Midtown. During graduation, they announced that Peter had the highest scholastic average in the school's history, which earned him a scholarship for science at Empire State University, or ESU, and alongside him was Flash with a football scholarship. For the start of this new era, we say goodbye to Liz Allen. She tells Peter that she always liked him, but he didn't like her back, so she was closing the book on them. We see Liz one more time in issue number 30, but we don't see her again in the decade that I'm covering in this video. I know she comes back later though. And speaking of Liz, how about her competitor for Peter's heart? Well, it's complicated. Ned Leeds is eventually brought into the picture, who was a fan favorite in the MCU films. Badass. But the comic version of him is worlds different. He's actually an adult a bit older than Peter, and he works at the Daily Bugle, where he and Betty start seeing each other. He was actually introduced in issue number 18 and 19, but issue 29 is where it becomes clear he might have a chance to steal Betty from Peter. In this issue, he protects her during an attack from the Scorpion, holding her and keeping her safe while Peter is off being Spider-Man. Honestly, I wish he took off with her right then and there because the Peter and Betty relationship is played out way too much if you ask me. 
Ned's there, but Betty still likes Peter. However, she says she doesn't want Peter to go out in the field and take pictures because it was too dangerous. But obviously, Peter is not going to stop because not only is he taking pictures, but he's out there fighting bad guys as Spider-Man. And this makes Betty very upset. Then Ned proposes to Betty, and I'm like, okay, finally, it's over. But no, she doesn't decide her answer yet because she still likes Peter. Then Peter makes it easy on her by getting mad and yelling at her, and later he pushes Ned in front of her like a hothead. At the end of that issue, there's this wonderful image by Ditko as it shows Spider-Man in between the two, showing that his secret identity is what made it not work. And at this point, I'm like, it was a bit dragged out, but I'm glad it ended there. Oh wait, there's more? Jesus Christ. Okay. So a few issues later, Betty tries to talk to Peter, but when she sees his beaten up face, she runs away crying. She's gone for a while, and Peter assumes that she went to marry Ned, while Ned assumes that she ran off with Peter, but the two soon realize that neither had seen her in ages. Then a few issues later, we see that she ran away, but she decided to come back. While in New York, she runs into Peter, and it's super awkward. Peter even thinks to himself that they're like strangers, and he's so relieved when Ned shows up. And that's when this super dragged out story is finally over as she chooses to be with Ned. Thank God. <laughs> Now, after all of that, let's look at one of the best Spider-Man stories ever written, If This Be My Destiny. One of the biggest aspects of this story is that it introduces some new characters, Gwen Stacy and Harry Osborn, two characters that change the game. Unfortunately though, they start off hating Peter. They think Peter's ignoring them, when really he was in deep thought about his sick and dying aunt. And I have to say, this was so frustrating to read, because you just want the best for Peter as he starts at ESU. But now, the Spider-Man part of the story. We find out that Doc Ock is behind all of the crime going on, and the story opens with this epic fight scene where Spidey boards a moving helicopter. Meanwhile, Peter, with the help of Dr. Connors, aka the Lizard, fixes May's blood to save her, but they realize it's going to take hours to develop. So in the meantime, Spidey gets help from Foswell, showing how far the relationship has come, and Foswell leads him to Doc Ock's underwater hideout. During their fight, the building starts to crumble, and Spidey gets stuck under a massive piece of steel, meaning he can't save May. All seems lost, but he gathers all the strength he has, and in an incredible full-page illustration, he's able to lift it off. A scene that was actually placed in Spider-Man Homecoming when Tom Holland's Spider-Man lifted the building off of himself. Spidey has the fight of his life even though he has no more gas in the tank, and he makes it just in time to save Aunt May. This story really pushes Spidey to his limits, more so than we had ever seen up until this point, and that's why it's such a monumental story even to this day. While starting at ESU, Peter's coolness sort of regressed, as he no longer has girls going after him, and he's back to being bullied just like he was at Midtown in the early comics, but this time by Flash, Harry, and Gwen. Slowly though, Gwen starts to like Peter, but she keeps this to herself. Everything sort of changes in the next story I want to highlight though, issue number 39 called How Green Was the Goblin. Things actually change here both in the story and behind the scenes. Co-creator Steve Ditko abruptly stopped illustrating, splitting up the power duo of Stan and Steve that the world had come to love. In his place was John Romita, who would soon become a legend in Spider-Man history as well. At first, he tried to mimic Ditko style as he believed Ditko would be back very soon, convinced that someone wouldn't be foolish enough to walk away from such a successful series that he helped create. But after a while, Ramita realized he wasn't coming back, so he started doing his own style, and I love it. Gone were the many panel pages, and in came more elaborate panels that fit the page very differently. He also started adding more bone structure to his characters, which actually made Spider-Man look much more buff and made Peter look a lot cooler. Ramita was also great at drawing comics. Comedy, my favorite example being Peter having to wash his Spidey suit but not having a private place to do it, so he wears a paper bag to the laundromat. Just seeing all the people watching him is hysterical. And this was all Ramita. He came up with that whole sequence when sketching, and the writers were like, this is gold, we're keeping this. But anyway, back to Ramita's first issue. We meet Harry Osborn's dad, Norman, for the first time, and we see their father and son dynamic, which is not good. When Harry is down on himself at ESU, Peter goes up to him to see if he's alright, and all of a sudden, Harry, Gwen, and even Flash starts to like him, all of them becoming friends. The story really gets crazy though when the Goblin successfully takes Spider-Man's spider sense away without Peter knowing. This led to him taking off his costume while the Goblin was on his tail, and the Green Goblin becomes the first person to ever learn Spidey's true identity. He follows him to Aunt May's house, and a crazy fight goes down. Then at the end of the issue, we finally learn the Green Goblin's identity, none other than Norman Osborn, Harry's father. 
Spider-Man eventually escapes and another fight breaks out. In the chaos, the building they're in is set on fire and Norman loses his memory, forgetting the last several years, which includes the fact that he's the Green Goblin and that Peter is Spider-Man. Peter burns the Goblin costume and tells everyone that Norman heroically helped him defeat his nemesis. This story is a wild ride from start to finish, and it's clear why it's an instant classic. As I said before, with Ramita's drawings, Peter looks a lot cooler, and not only that, he's written a lot cooler. He buys a motorcycle that he rides to college, he now has a friend group with Gwen who is beginning to like him, Harry, and surprisingly Flash. And not long after that, one more person would be added to this group. In issue number 42, we finally see Peter meet MJ, and we as an audience finally see her face. On the last page, she says her famous line, Face it Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. Peter starts hanging out with MJ a lot more, sort of dating, but not really because MJ is more of a free spirit. If you've only seen the movies, at this point in time in the comics, MJ is nothing like she was in the films. She's not as serious, she doesn't have the insecurities that movie MJ has, and honestly, she's not that nice. She knows she's beautiful and uses it to her advantage, sometimes in hurtful ways. When it had sort of become clear that they were dating, Peter had to cancel a date for Spider-Man reasons, and later that night, he saw her on a date with Harry instead. This makes Peter think to himself that she pretty much uses guys. Eventually though, we start to see a rivalry between Gwen and MJ for Peter's heart, much like Betty and Liz, but much more intense. They'll straight up call each other out, like MJ saying in front of everyone that it bothered Gwen when she was alone with Peter, or when Gwen threatened to rip MJ's hair out if she tried to make a move on Peter. Their rivalry is another thing that really shows how cool Peter has become. There's a great panel where two on-looking guys ask how he got the two most beautiful girls to fight over him, and they asked what he had that they didn't. That's a question. That's a question. Around this time, Harry gives Peter an offer to move into an apartment with him that his dad is fully paying for. Peter excitedly agrees, and he starts this new chapter in his life, but of course Aunt May had to go and make a big deal out of it, crying and making Peter feel bad. There's an interesting scene where Peter meets Norman Osborn for the first time, and just thinking about the history these two share, there's a lot of irony with this first introduction. If you ask me, I think this is where the Spider-Man comics really hit their stride. They no longer relied on just Spider-Man and the villains to carry the story. They had an amazing cast of characters, all of whom intertwined quite nicely. This little friend group soon became one of my favorite parts of the series, and I would find myself reading an epic action scene on the left and sneaking a peek to the right, and as soon as I saw the gang, I immediately got excited. Comparing this to my other favorite superhero, Batman, I don't really care about his personal life. I just want to see him kick ass. Spider-Man has that rare appeal where I really care about Spider-Man's alter ego and his personal life. For me, it's part of what makes the character so great. This was also around the time that Spider-Man was actually recruited by the Avengers for the first time, and the third annual edition called To Be an Avenger. We see the Avengers discussing whether or not they should allow Spider-Man to join them. As soon as he's with them, Spidey instantly gets mad and boldly starts a fight. They later give him a test, which was to find the Hulk, but with the misunderstanding, Peter refused to help lock the Hulk up, instead opting to say he was unable to do it. What Spidey didn't know was the Avengers did not want to lock the Hulk up, but rather they wanted to help him. So Spider-Man's first interaction with the Avengers could have been better. I don't want to brag, but I will. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? We eventually have a big revelation in the comic series as we find out that Flash, a character that has literally been around since the very first page of the Spider-Man comics, is going away to fight overseas. We see Peter and Flash put all of their differences aside as Peter wishes him luck and shakes his hand. And this is the least Peter can do because after Flash leaves, Peter steals his girl Gwen. Gwen and Peter go on their first date to a science expo, and the relationship only grows from there. Peter eventually admits to himself that he's in love with Gwen, which is a startling realization for him. I actually adore Peter and Gwen together, and reading all of these early comics, it made me love them even more. And this of course for me made what we all know is going to come cut much deeper, but we'll get to that later. Around this time, we start seeing more three-part stories rather than one-off stories, which allows them to add more complexity to the narratives. Instead of having to tell a story in 20 pages, they now have 60, which is a whole new ballgame. One of the best examples of this was issues number 50 to 53, which was called Spider-Man No More. This story was actually one of the biggest inspirations for the second Sam Raimi film. After being out as Spider-Man, Harry tells Peter that his aunt is sick, which rocks his world. On top of that, he's told by his professor that his grades are slipping which we actually saw in the movie as well. Your grades have been steadily declining? You're late for class? You always appear exhausted. 
So with everything happening, Peter decides to abandon his alter ego, leading to one of the most iconic shots in all of Spider-Man. This is probably my favorite sketch John Romita ever made for the Web Slinger. And the second Sam Raimi film of course recreated this to perfection. And if I'm being honest, that too was probably one of my favorite shots in all of the Sam Raimi films. Just like in the movie, Jameson has brought Spidey's costume, and he hilariously hangs it up in his office. With Spider-Man gone though, crime explodes, and in comes one of Spider-Man's most iconic villains, the Kingpin. While Peter was granted more time to be with MJ in the film, Peter was of course dating Gwen in the comic, so MJ and Gwen are switched out, but either way, Peter is happier than ever without being a crime fighter. However, he eventually has a moment where he finds out about a robbery, and again, the movie perfectly showed Peter unbuttoning his shirt only to find his Spidey costume wasn't there, just like in the comics. As time goes on though, he remembers the pledge he made after Uncle Ben's death, and he decides it's time to go back into action. Then, remember Frederick Foswell? Well, jealous by the Kingpin's success, he has a change of heart about crime, and he confronts the Kingpin, which does not go well, but Kingpin does allow him to be part of his team. We then see this tubby guy turn into perhaps the deadliest Spider-Man villain we've ever seen, as it becomes clear that all 300 pounds of him are pure muscle, as he takes Spidey down single-handed. With Foswell helping the Kingpin, they bring in Jameson, and the publisher is crushed to find out Foswell betrayed him. All hell breaks loose though when Spider-Man and Jameson get free, and when the Kingpin gives Foswell orders, he refuses to kill anyone. Instead, Foswell helps Jameson escape, but in the process, he's shot. And just as the issue was called, Foswell died a hero. This was one of my favorite stories from the decade that I read. It introduces an amazing new villain. It forces Jameson to trust Spider-Man, the person he hates more than anyone else. It gives a fitting ending to one of the most intriguing characters in the series. And it really makes good use of the three-part storytelling, adding more depth to the narrative than we had ever seen before. It's a good thing this story was a banger, because the next few that follow were kind of lame. This is one of those examples I promised I'd give you that explain why I hate Aunt May in the comics. Despite knowing that he went to jail and committed many crimes, Aunt May says, Hey, Dr. Octopus, come live in my house with me. You seem like a great guy. Peter soon finds out and tries to warn her, but Aunt May tells him off for this. Doc Ock then threatens Peter, which is actually a cool dynamic with him not knowing that he was really speaking to Spider-Man, who had kicked his ass on several occasions. So with Peter not able to get through to Aunt May, he instead goes into the house as Spider-Man. And though she wasn't scared of Doc Ock, who was clearly a villain with his mechanical arms out, she's so terrified at the sight of Spider-Man that she goes into a state of shock. A pissed off Peter then goes after Dr. Octopus, but when he's hit with a blast, he loses his memory, and Doc Ock convinces him that he's his partner in crime. So for the next few issues, Spider-Man is a villain taking orders from Doc Ock, which, if I'm being honest, was not their best work. One of the few good things that came out of this story arc, though, was the introduction of Captain George Stacy, the retired police captain and the father of Gwen Stacy. And for you movie lovers, the Captain Stacy in the comics is very different than the movie version. First off, he's much older, as he's retired at this point, while in the movie, he was young and still in his prime as police captain. The movie version also hated Spider-Man and was furious about his involvement men and police stuff. I stand for law and order, son. That's what I stand for, okay? I, I wear a badge. This guy wears a mask like a, you know, like a, like an outlaw. But the comic version actually really liked Spider-Man. He was super intrigued by him and had actually researched him quite a bit. George Stacy quickly became an amazing addition to the characters we already had. And on top of that, we got another great character addition with Joe Robbie Robertson, the editor at the Daily Bugle. And he's just an overall great guy. He's a good counter to Jameson when it comes to the Bugle scenes, which I think was desperately needed. The Bugle was always this toxic place because of Jameson, but now that Robertson's there, it's less toxic and more of a safe place at times. But now it's time to look at the next story highlight, The Goblin Lives. Over the last few issues, we had seen signs of Norman's memory coming back, and in this story, he finally remembers who he is. This leads to one of the most thrilling scenes that has zero action, as Norman has a dinner party inviting Peter along with Gwen, MJ, and his son Harry, and Peter is just waiting for something to happen. Norman just toys with him, even punching him in the gut when no one was looking. We're so used to seeing Spider-Man versus the Green Goblin, so seeing Peter versus Norman was a cool change of pace. Peter successfully clears out the apartment ensuring he could take the goblin down without anyone close to him getting hurt and without them figuring out either his or Norman's secret identity. Once alone, the two throw down, battling both on the ground and in the sky. Ultimately, Peter uses Norman's own psychedelic drugs against him, and I have to say, the artwork for this scene is absolutely magnificent. Ramita did an incredible job. 
But anyway, Peter geniusly uses the psychedelics to make Norman forget both his own and Peter's alter egos. It's another story that shows just how much of a threat the Green Goblin is, and how easy it is for him to come back. It makes the innocent Norman a constant threat even when he isn't the Goblin. Shortly after that, we have another banger as we discover the truth about Peter's parents, a story that the film The Amazing Spider-Man 2 took a lot of inspiration from. In both the comic and the movie, Peter discovers that his parents were traitors to America, which Aunt May had hidden from him. Peter refused to accept this though, and in both mediums, he does his own investigating, though in the comics it's much more elaborate as he literally leaves the country to go to Algeria. There are a lot of twists and turns, as at first, he finds a Hydra identification card with his father's name on it, confirming that he was a traitor. Red Skull then appears, and we get some incredible action, again all of which was beautifully illustrated, especially with the flames from all of the explosions. The final showdown between Spidey and Red Skull ends in a draw, but Peter ultimately comes out on top in a different way. In the fire, the Hydra identification card burned away and revealed that his father was actually a spy for America, clearing his father's name and proving his parents were not traitors after all. Reading these comics in the 2020s, it's quite clear that they were written in the 60s and 70s, but that's not always a bad thing. While reading, I was like, why are these teenagers calling each other dad? I brought it up to my own dad, and he just started laughing, saying it was short for the slang term daddy-o, and we both had a good laugh about that. Around this time is when Peter and Gwen's relationship starts to get really strong, and this was one of my favorite aspects of these comics moving forward. There are times where Peter worries about not having any money to treat her well, and when he finally tells her, she completely validates his feelings, saying she doesn't care, hugging him, and one time even saying she was just going to cook a meal for them instead of going out. Their relationship was just so well written, and the way it slowly developed over time made it even more meaningful. Gwen herself is a very strong character, and you see this when she slapped the shit out of another student who disrespected Peter behind his back. She's this strong, confident, and caring girl, which at the time perfectly played off MJ's character. MJ was the complete opposite, she was very shallow, and that of course made the two girls into interaction something I look forward to, because on the outside, they're the same, a beautiful girl that got constant attention from men, but then on the inside, they're the total opposites, which made for some good dialogue. The next story I want to highlight though is called The Schemer. This story develops Kingpin and his family for the first time. We find out that he has a wife named Vanessa and had a son who had supposedly died, which his wife just found out he was hiding from her. Meanwhile, the comic features a new villain named The Schemer, who's wreaking all sorts of havoc, and eventually he comes face to face with the Kingpin and Vanessa. Shockingly, Vanessa protects him and tells him to leave immediately, and when the Kingpin finds this out, he demands to know what was going on between The Schemer and his wife. We then get a huge shock as we discover that the schemer is really his son who hadn't actually died, and this crazy development sends Kingpin into a state of shock. It's the first time we really see the Kingpin be fully beaten, and it's in the most unexpected way possible. Issue number 90 entitled, And Death Shall Come, is one we have to talk about. The first Amazing Spider-Man film took inspiration from this issue, as we see the death of Gwen's father, Captain Stacy. It was shocking and heartbreaking for readers at the time, and even though I knew it was coming, it still cut deep and shocked me. One thing that might be interesting is pointing out how the comic and the movie differed for this scene, because there are some major differences. In both, he died a hero, but in the movie, it was him holding off the lizard for Spider-Man, while in the comic, it was him pushing a kid out of the way of some wreckage from Doc Ock. In the film, Captain Stacy found out Peter's identity through a physical struggle, pinning him to one spot and forcing him to turn around. Meanwhile, in the comic, he found out not using physical means, but by using his mind and his detective skills. Also, in the comic, Peter doesn't know he has this knowledge until his final words. And speaking of his final words, this is the biggest difference from comic to movie. In the movie, he of course told Peter to stay away from Gwen. Leave Gwen. Uh, promise me that. But in the comic, he told Peter the complete opposite, saying he was all she had now and to take care of her. Gwen also had immediate family in the movies, but in the comics she did not, her father was all she had. The very next issue entitled, And Now the Goblin is another one we have to go over. First off, can we appreciate the style in this? Harry and Peter look fly AF. 
This is one of those stories that shows how shallow MJ is at this point in her life, as Harry is excited to introduce her to his father, but in front of Harry and Norman, she ditches Harry and starts flirting with Peter instead. This story also hits some pretty dark topics, as MJ ditching Harry for Peter and later MJ just absolutely destroying his confidence leads Harry to his drug addiction, which I immediately identified with being a recovering drug addict and alcoholic myself. Seeing Harry pop pills really hit home for me, and the message the comic sends is one that should still be said loud and clear even today, that drugs aren't just a ghetto thing, as it hits all ages, races, and classes. Meanwhile, this story arc also focuses on Norman Osborn as he finds an old goblin hideout. When he finds one of his old suits in a glider, the memory of his villainy returns to him. This leads to an epic fight between Spidey and the goblin, and the artwork is incredible as always. Spider-Man eventually gets the upper hand, and while wrapped around the goblin's neck, he steers him to Harry's hospital window, and the sight of his sick son snaps Norman out of it. Also, the ending is something I have to point out, because it's one of the few times that Spidey actually gets a happy ending, which the writers hilariously point out. Issue number 100 was one I was looking forward to, because, well, it's issue 100. I thought they'd do something special. However, if you ask me, it was a real disappointment. Crap. Crap. Mega crap. Issue 100 saw Peter drinking something to rid himself of his spider powers, but instead it made him grow four extra arms. This is a thing until around issue 102, and it just felt weird. Luckily, things get better, because in issue 107 and 108, we saw the return of Flash Thompson, and he's immediately in danger upon his arrival in New York. This arc sees Doctor Strange teaming up with Spider-Man to save Flash, and it's a wild ride. We also get a nice callback to the Spider-Man fan club Flash made while in high school, which was a great detail. This issue also saw Gwen yelling at Aunt May, saying that she was too maternal to Peter and said that she treated him too much like a little kid. Me disliking Aunt May in the comics, I was like, hell yeah, you tell her Gwen. But then Aunt May made me hate her even more, as she dipped on everyone, leaving only a note. Then a few issues go by without any mention of her, and I'm like, this is great. But then when it comes time to find out where she's been, I rolled my eyes so far back, I was scared they wouldn't go back in place. She decided to move in with Doc Ock at his home in Westchester, where she had been taking care of him and all of his goons, not even knowing that she was helping master criminals. Later, she even defends Ock by holding a gun to Spider-Man, and this bitch actually shoots! Luckily for Spidey, and also for Aunt May, she missed, but still, come on. <laughs> Then, even when Doc Ock is arrested right in front of her and Peter asks her to come home, she says no, opting to stay in Doc Ock's house to wait for his return. Like, come on, I hate this bitch. She's great in the movies, but here, my god. Issues 116 to 118 were really weird. I started reading it and I was like, wait, I've read this story before. I had to really think about it, but I soon realized this was the same story with the same drawings as another Spider-Man special that came out a few years before it called Low This Monster. But the difference was they colorized it and added a few things to make it fit into the current day Spider-Man. In the original black and white story, it's about an election where a man named Rally is running for office, a sketchy dude who behind the scenes is forcing a scientist to make this monster for him. Then in the retelling copied version, it's the same plot, but they added a villain named the disruptor whose identity is this big mystery but they put him in the exact same scenes with the exact same dialogue as rally so if you had read the old story which most diehard spider-man fans probably had you immediately know that rally and the disruptor were the same person but overall it was still an enjoyable read and it was interesting to see what they changed and what they added all in all though a very weird decision on the creator's part and now we get to the last story arc I'm covering in this video, which houses two of arguably the best Spider-Man comics ever made. It's actually what both the first Sam Raimi film, as well as what The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was based on, which shows how iconic it is. They don't give us the title of the story at the beginning, which had never been done before. It starts off with Harry being sick from his drug use again. Meanwhile, Norman starts going mad, seeing Spider-Man right in front of him when he wasn't really there, until finally he gets his memory back and becomes the Green Goblin again. Remembering Spider-Man's identity, he immediately goes to Peter's apartment, but instead of finding Peter there, he finds Gwen. He kidnaps her and takes her to the famous bridge, and we see perhaps the most shocking moment ever told in comic book history. After a long, hard-fought battle, the Green Goblin pushes Gwen over the edge of the bridge, and Peter just barely gets his web on her. Thinking he saved her, he pulls her back up. Then he discovers the terrible truth that she had died. 
As the first part ends, they finally reveal the title of the story, The Night Gwen Stacy Died. And this was also one of the most heartbreaking moments in all of the Spider-Man movies as well. <laughs> no, please, please. We then move on to the next issue in the story arc called The Goblin's Last Stand. The beginning of this honestly brought me to tears. Reading the part with all of the flashbacks pretty much broke me, especially because I had spent the last three months falling in love with this character. I felt so connected to Gwen, and I adored her relationship with Peter, so to see it come to an end like this was heartbreaking. Peter then goes on a revenge tour, which makes him ignore his best friend Harry who was tripping on LSD, and boy oh boy would he regret that, but that's a whole other story. The final battle between Spider-Man and the Green Goblin had elements taken from both Tom Holland's fight with him in No Way Home, and of course in Sam Raimi's final battle. Just like in No Way Home, he beats the crap out of him as revenge for killing a loved one, whether that was Gwen or Aunt May. <laughs> Norman Osborn then impales himself with his own glider, which Sam Raimi's movie copied almost frame for frame. In the movie, he of course says, Don't tell Harry. But in the comic, Harry already knows, as he saw the whole thing happen, and he was the one who took the Green Goblin costume off his father, ensuring it was Norman Osborn mourn that night, not his alter ego. The epilogue is something I have to discuss, as MJ sees Peter after Gwen's death. Peter horribly insults her, saying she wouldn't even care about her own mother's death, and told her to get out. A crying MJ begins to leave, but she stops herself. She shuts the door and turns toward Peter, ready to be there for him despite the awful things he said. It's a moment that really makes MJ grow as a character and become the girl who would eventually become Peter's partner. And we see this again after Gwen's funeral, because who's there by Peter's side? MJ. Following this last arc, it's a new day for Spider-Man as we know him, and that's the reason I cut the video off here. Well, that, and also it being a good cutoff point because it's at almost exactly a decade. It's crazy to think that I only covered 10 years of Spider-Man's 60-year timeline, so maybe if this video does well, which I hope it does, please like and share. Maybe I'll make some more videos on the amazing Spider-Man. But for now, that's all I have for you, so I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.